in principle, should go after I complete the thing that I cannot complete, which is uh, you take a wire, a thick wire, you look at the minimal set uh, that you get by plunging the wire into soap and lift it, lifting it up. Each of these sets satisfies the uh, FUNG conditions. So we control the sets for the thick wires. And we just ask what happens when the thickness of a wire goes to zero. Does the minimal set that you get tend to a minimal set we bounded by just a line? If it does, how does it happen exactly? And things like this. Okay. And I, I think the best way to solve this is to solve the other problem to know exactly what the limit should be. And then afterwards, you can try to see whether the limit is reached normally or in a weird way. OK, so that's, but I, I think it's an interesting question to see, you know, when you have a thick wire, uh, how does, uh, how does uh, the picture change? OK, so this is a picture of that. This is a reasonably thick wire. And you can think that the wire will go down. What is the picture that you will see? In principle, at the limit, you should get a minimal cone for the line. There is no minimal cone for the line where there is something, uh, a, a plane which is like this. So what is expected is a picture like this when the flat thing becomes more and more vertical and tends to a plane that contains the line. And then things have to arrange to themselves. But for instance, this sort of picture I cannot justify. It's uh, something that I hope is true. Okay. Don't feel bad about asking questions uh, because this will just slow me down and then you'll suffer more, uh, you'll suffer less for the last part. <laughs> okay. No problem. Okay. So uh, I hesitated and finally I've been rushing the previous part so that I can talk a little bit about this part. And I will not be able to complete this part, but let me tell you first a little bit why I want to talk about it. Uh, Part of this is the, I, I believe that if you want to prove existence results for, I think, this sliding problem that I've been talking about, and probably also for the existence of size minimizing currents, uh, there will be no hope if you do not control a little bit the regularity of the potential minimizers. Okay? So, in other words, at school we were told the way to solve things is first you prove existence, then you prove regularity. I believe it's exactly the other way around, right? You first prove regularity of minimizers, and then, and then if minimizers are regular, you have a chance of proving existence, okay? Which is bad news for me because it means that in dimensions larger than two, I don't hope to prove existence results because the situation is more complicated. But anyway, let's talk about dimension two. So uh, I will not be that precise, but I will try to describe to you a scheme which starts from uh, Vincent Favrier's thesis, which I think is neat in itself, uh, which people usually don't like, so I'll try to sell it one more time. Okay. Uh, and it's a general scheme for proving existence. And here I claim the scheme works in a very special, simple case which is the case where uh, we are working uh, on a manifold, but the manifold is a very simple manifold. It's the manifold that you take by picking a finite number of cubes and identifying some of the faces of the cubes so that you get something in which you can continue to draw dyadic cubes, okay? And which has no boundary, and if it has no boundary, it's easy because I don't have to decide which sort of plateau problem I'm looking at, okay? And which has some topology because this way I know that minimal surfaces can exist, okay? So that's the, uh, that's the setting, but in some sense the setting is not so important. I want to talk about the scheme. And again, we want to prove existence of minimizers, let's say in the sliding category, uh, okay? Oh, sorry, or oh, in this case it's the plane category because there is no boundary, okay? Right. Uh, there is only one way that I can prove existence uh, myself is by taking minimizing sequences, making them tend to a limit, and hopefully the limit will be the minimizer that I expect. That's what I'd want to do. Okay. 
Uh, so again, let me see if I read, if I said everything that I wanted to say. We have this uh, simple situation where you have this manifold without boundary, which is composed of cubes, so that I can talk about dyadic cubes in, in there. Uh, I need non-trivial topology so that the problem be is not trivial. I start from a given set E0, and I try to minimize Hausdorff measure among all the deformations in that manifold of a set E0, okay? Uh, and, okay, uh, right. And the general scheme is the following. And then uh, what I have here is the advantage of what I took as decisions to make the problem simpler. There is this flatness about the cube so that I can draw the cubes in my manifold without thinking about it too much. Otherwise you would have to be, I mean, otherwise you would have to play with charts. It's Okay, it's painful. Uh, Vincent is currently doing it if he didn't finish it, but it's more work. Uh, no boundaries so that I don't have to worry about the boundary, but in this case, uh, I know for at least one example proved by Fang that you can deal with boundaries. It's just uh, this way we don't have to mention this. And unfortunately, there is this last advantage, which is I'll stay in dimension two, because this is the dimension where there is some regularity result for the minimal set. Okay, right, okay, so we start. Uh, we look at E, the class that we're interested in, which is all the deformations of my initial set, and we try to minimize uh, Hausdorff measure in this class, and so we call M the intimum. Then, as I said, there is only one thing that I can do. I'll take a minimizing sequence uh, uh, for which the Hausdorff measure tends to the minimum, and I try to extract the subsequence that converges and show that the limit is okay, okay? Uh, so far, we all do like this, except that from time to time, the object of interest is not a set, but for instance, in the case of Antonio, a measure, in the case of uh, many other people, a current, and then the difficulties appear in a different place each time. Okay. Right. So the general strategy I repeated three times, so it's okay. Now, uh, what are the obstacles? There is obstacle number one, which is not the bad one, and I'll mention that a little bit uh, later, which is uh, there is only one way to make sure that there is a limit when I take a subsequence, which is to use host of conversions. If I use host of conversions, uh, a priori, I don't know exactly whether, for instance, host of measure will be lower semi-continuous, whether it will go to the limit or not. It's much better if host of measure goes to the limit, okay? But anyway, that's one of the problems here. Uh, I mentioned in the slide that there are other problems about parameterizations. Let's try to parameterize at the last moment because otherwise parameterizations will go to infinity and that's not good, okay? So we'll take the limit as a limit of sets in Hausdorff convergence and we'll have to make sure that the Hausdorff measure goes to the limit and I tell you how it's going to work. Uh, we'll have to take a special subsequence which satisfies some quasi-minimality property, so that one of the theorems I talked about about lower semi-continuity or Hofstorff measure applies, and we, we, we get out of trouble because of this. So this is host of convergence, uh, problem number one. Problem number two is hairs. So what do I mean by hairs? You th there is this beautiful surface here that is the minimizer, and the minimizing in taking this one plus extremely thin little additions like this, uh, just think about tiny worms, okay, or hairs, okay. Uh, it costs almost no measure, so this uh, minimal, uh, minimizing sequence could be like this, something like this. And of course, if, you if I don't cut the hairs, what will happen is that the minimizing sequence will converge to the whole space for instance, or anything that I want. Uh, so that's not good. So we'll have to cut hairs sometime so that I have an acceptable minimizing sequence. And after that, I can try to think about limits, okay? This is also what uh, Reifenberg did, I think. Uh, I mean, cutting, there is some session of cutting hairs in Reifenberg's initial paper uh, about the homology problem, okay? So that's number one, okay? And again, the, the way we are going to cut the hair is to do a Federer-Fleming projection 
on a network of cubes uh, so that it becomes quasi-minimal. Okay. Uh, was it really? Okay, right. So, lower semi-continuities. I, I sort of mixed uh, Hausdorff measure and lower semi-continuity, but this is this is linked with the fact that we have to take Hausdorff measures. So it's this thing here that we want at the end. And in order to have it at the end, uh, it's enough to take a minimizing sequence, which is uniformly quasi-minimal. I have here a definition of quasi-minimal. It's just a little bit more general than the almost minimal sets that I have. And the properties that I mentioned before, like rectifiability, alpha regularity, and so on and so forth, and the lower semi-continuity of Hausdorff measure are true for quasi-minimal sets, okay? So we'll try to take a sequence of uniformly quasi-minimal competitors, and then we'll save for this part, okay? All right. Okay, so if we can do this, we'll, be, uh, we'll solve half of the problem. The other half, and this is the part which creates trouble all the time, uh, we get this sequence, uh, this minimizing sequence. We take a Hausdorff limit of this sequence. How do we know that the limit is a competitor, right? So in the case of deformations, you know, you have deformations, for instance, by Lipschitz mapping. Each of the competitor is a Lipschitz image of a set. The Lipschitz functions get worse and worse. And the limiting set maybe is not the Lipschitz image of the initial guy because the, you know, there was some jump or something like this. So the, you have always to include a last step where you verify that the limit that you get is still a good competitor, okay? So for instance, in the Reifenberg homological problem, it's okay because you choose a homology such that when you take a limit of guys which are competitors, automatically you can go to the limit and the limit also satisfies the same condition. Uh, there are linking conditions by Harrison and Pugh, and again, the limiting conditions, uh, sorry, they connect the in linking conditions uh, that they have. They are nice because when you take a limit of linking sets, it still links, so this part works fine, okay? And there is the typical bad problem, which is uh, size minimizing current. You have this set of size minimizing currents. You look at the support. The uh, multiplicities in the current do what they like. Maybe they tend to infinity. You get this limiting set. How do you find a multiplicity on the limiting set so that it is a size minimizing current? That yeah. might be tough, okay? And the way it's going to be less tough is by saying, oh, this set is beautiful, so by hand I can put multiplicities. Okay, that's in the good case. Right, all this, uh, so this is issues. Then, uh, okay, so again, okay. So I say it now, uh, I was wondering whether I would say it now or later. So in the case of a sliding competitor, what, what's happening? For this last part, this is what we're going to say. We have this uh, uh, minimizing sequence of quasi-minimal sets. Uh, they are uniformly quasi-minimal, so you can apply the limiting theorems. And the limiting theorem says that the limit is a minimal set. You don't know if it's in the class we started with, but at least it's a minimal set. And we're in dimension two, so in dimension two, we can control the regularity of minimal sets because there is a gene Taylor theorem. Remember, we have no boundary here, so things are easier. So we get this description of the limit, and the limit is just a bunch of faces that make nice angles with each other, with maybe a finite number of singularities, something nice, okay? Now, we know this thing is nice, so it's very easy to build a retraction from a neighborhood of this limiting set to the set, so a mapping that sends a neighborhood of a set to the set, which is Lipschitz, okay? We build this retraction, and now why is the set a competitor? That's easy, because 
you have a sequence that tends to the set. Those guys are Lipschitz images. I'll just draw a picture. So you had the initial set, let's E0. So you have the set E infinity. So it, it could be more complicated than that, but that's okay. Uh, I said e infinity is nice and smooth, and there is this retraction here from a neighborhood of E0 to the set E0. E0 is the limit of sets EK. Here is a set EK. For K large enough, it's close to E infinity. We have actually a green map from E0 to EK, which is a Lipschitz mapping. And I'm saying I compose this with a retraction and I get a Lipschitz mapping from E0 to the limit. So this is the way you prove that the limit is a competitor, right? And unfortunately, you need regularity. Why things are hard in higher dimensions. All right. Okay. So, so far so good. I think the only thing that is left for me to tell you is why on earth can I find a uh, minimizing sequence which is composed of quasi-minimal sets, so same, I mean, they have some regularity, with uniform quasi-minimal bounds. That's what I have to do, right? Uh, which I call the quasi-minimal uh, haircut. So again, I, I will start from uh, any minimizing sequence and I first make it better so that each set is quasi-minimal and so on and so forth, okay? That's what I need to do. Okay. And again, I have this common saying that since no one understands this proof, I will repeat it up to the moment when people are so bored that they will say, yes, it's fine, okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, here is the definition of quasi-minimal sets, and I will skip it for you. It's just, you know, instead of uh, requiring that the set, the measure of a set is less than the measure of the uh, competitor plus something small, here I allow the measure of a set to become k times larger, and I have to measure only among uh, whatever I change, w, w phi is the place where I change things, okay? I'm saying whatever I change, I can maybe divide the measure by k, but not more. That's the definition of a quasi-minimal set. And the main property is that uh, it's fairly easy to obtain. And the theorems that I had before are still true. That's the two main properties. Okay? Right. And for instance, a uh, by Lipschitz image of a minimal set is a quasi-minimal set. Uh, because the definitions are like this. Okay? But it, so it gives you some stability. Okay? And uh, I had a list of uh, examples, but... Uh, this uh, I will not insist so much. Again, the reason why I like the notion is that it is flexible enough so that I can work with it. And we'll see uh, the way we get quasi-minimal uh, sets. Okay, so how do I do a quasi-minimal haircut? So I have this set, EK, it's one of the competitors. It's not looking so beautiful. How, I can, how can I make it look more beautiful? Uh, let me try a first attempt. I take a dyadic grid, make it very fine, it's not going to be more costly to make the grid finer. So think about a finely, uh, very thin grid of dyadic cubes, okay? And then I take this set and I just feather Fleming project it on the grid because I don't know how to do anything else. So I feather Fleming project, okay? And I get a new competitor for this guy which is living on the grid, okay? Right, and I'm saying, uh, okay, so this is one competitor, okay? And then, you, uh, you know, I can look at all the other competitors that lie in the same grid, and maybe some of them will do better. So what I do is I just minimize among people in the grid. So unions of faces of dimension D and maybe faces of dimension D minus one that are competitors, so that are deformations of my, mini uh, my initial set, and that live in that grid, okay? So I start from EKA, I projected it on the grid, and I say, okay, maybe this one is not beautiful, I'll take the best competitor which lives in the grid, okay? So it's a minimizer in the grid, it exists because the grid is finite, okay? Uh, and uh, what I claim somewhere here, except that I have lots of definitions, so I, I claim that 
if I do this, if I take a, competi a competitor which is living in the grid and minimizing in the grid, by definition, it has to be quasi-minimal. Okay? It's probably on the next slide. Okay? Uh, F is quasi-minimal, so this is what I call the important lemma. F is quasi-minimal with constants that don't depend on the grid, and in particular on how small the grid is. It's just quasi-minimal with some constant. Why do you prove it? You have this set that lives on the grid. You imagine a competitor that maybe lives outside of the grid. You project it by, by, back by Federer Fleming back on the grid. The Federer Fleming projection is not doing things much worse. I mean, maybe it multiplies things by a constant C, but it's okay. It stays quasi-minimal. So the initial was minimal in the grid. And I'm saying that when you're minimal in the grid, you're automatically quasi-minimal in space. Because you can always, you know, given a competitor, you can always Federer Fleming project it back to the grid and compare everything, okay? And again, this is, you know, uh, this is where we like the flexibility because of course we, you know, a competitor which is just composed This, is, this could be a piece of competitor living in the grid. Of course, you can do better by replacing the two segments by this, but you don't win more than a factor of two or something, okay? That's what I want. Right, okay. Almost finished. Uh, so there is a problem is that I started from a minimizing sequence. I projected it on the grid. And of course, if the grid, I mean, essentially, you know, this was my minimizing sequence. It just happened to be nice, okay? And then I decided to further project it on the grid, which means that I've been essentially replacing by something like this, okay? And of course, I've been losing, I mean, I, I started from a minimizing sequence, and the new one would not be a minimizing sequence, okay? So here comes the trouble. So this is because I've been taking a dryadic grid. What I have to do instead is, given the set of a minimizing sequence, construct an adapted grid, which is not the dyadic grid, but which is composed, which for instance, locally here, would be more a dyadic grid like this, okay? Uh, I can do this locally wherever the place is, uh, wherever the set is, let's say, locally rectifiable. Then I get lots of little grids. There is this complicated theorem of Vincent which says that when you have local grids like this, you can complete this into a global grid, which is not composed of squares, but of objects that are fine width. And again, there is an adapted grid to the set EK <coughs> with uniform bounds on everything. You project on this grid, and this way you get someone whose surface is almost the same as what, we, what you started with, okay? And then you complete as before. So in other words, you have to replace the dyadic grid that I was talking about by some adapted grid so that the minimizing sequence stays a minimizing sequence. And that's the hard part, okay? But it can be done. Okay, and the rest, I think, was uh, under control, and I have to thank you for being patient for a long time. Yeah. <coughs> question, no question. Okay, question directly to the poor guy later. <laughs>